Well, hello, Air Force Academy. You know, they always give me the after lunch crowds. I don't know why. That's, that's a straw that I always draw. And uh, look, it, listen, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, I know a little bit about what you go through here. I'm not a Service Academy graduate. I was a, a Vanderbilt ROTC graduate. Uh, Army, but I did spend 12 years at the head of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership at West Point. So I was able to, to get here many times, and, and of course we had cadet ex exchanges, and, and I have to tell you, it's a real honor to be here. Um, what an incredibly important institution for our country <clears throat> and for the world, uh, and my hat's off to every single cadet who's in here who's made a conscious decision to take a path to serve your country and to do it at, at times that are not necessarily going to be good. You know, you're going to have to suck some things up. And, and that's really what I want to add to the dialogue here. I understand that you're going to talk a little bit tonight among one another about, about what I say. So I'm going to try to stay away from kind of the typical topics of, you know, why you need to be courageous or why you need to be ethical. And I'm going to talk to you about the reality of being in military service. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about failure. So we're going to talk about what happens when you're a leader in military units and things start to go wrong. Um, I, I was able, through BSNL, to, uh, to, to get some information from you all ahead of time. You took a, a survey that had three simple survey questions on it. And then you also uh, were asked to give your opinion about four case studies where a leader was out there doing their best and then failed and something bad happened. And you were able to vote on how you would handle that if you were in charge. And you know, a lot of leadership is knowing and understanding how your boss sees the world. You know, what, what, is, your, what is your superior seeing through his or her eyes? And it's also true looking downward. You know, if you can't see the world through the eyes of the airmen that you are leading, if you can't see how they view you and how they view the circumstances, how can you possibly influence them? How can you possibly say the right thing? So today is going to be hopefully some training and some learning on how to see the world through other people's eyes. And it's going to be kind of an ugly part of the world. You know, we're going to talk about things like failure. Um, you know, it's a characteristic of the schools that I've worked at, whether it was West Point, uh, I spent uh, almost four years at Yale, and then now at Rice University, all of them, you know, top-tier universities. And the people that come to these schools have, have a number of things in common, but one thing that they have in common is that most of you have never failed at anything in your lives, certainly not anything big, or you probably wouldn't be here, you know, maybe, maybe you wouldn't have made the cut that got you in here. So I'm going to introduce you to, to the concept of failure a little bit and talk about how it rattles around inside your brain, being worried about failure, <clears throat> and then we're really going to pick apart some of these decisions about how to lead when things are, are going wrong. So here was the first question that you got on that survey. If I do poorly at something, I usually prefer not to let anyone know. Now from an ethical perspective, do you see the, the challenges associated with people who really don't want to let anybody know when something went wrong? You see how that kind of sometimes turns into an ethical conundrum? And when we asked the, the uh, fourth class about that, here's kind of what they said. So it's a fairly normal distribution, except if you look there, the neutral bar, the one in the middle, is shorter than the bars on its right and its left. So if any of you have had any kind of basic statistics course, you'll recognize that as something called a bimodal distribution. It has two modes. And when you see a distribution like that, it usually suggests that there are sort of two separate groups of people that are filling out that question. You know, almost like two little distributions in and of themselves that are there. And so this question, is one of, of many questions, I only gave you three, but uh, of a longer instrument that measures fear of failure. And when you see someone who 
is, is strongly agreeing that if they do poorly at something, they prefer to not any, let anyone know, it could be that they're relatively high on fear of failure. Now, you can talk to your BSNL profs about personality traits and about how all this stuff works, but for today, all I want to do is to point out that there are members of the class who are pretty concerned about failure right now. And this is not unique to the Air Force Academy. I get this kind of bimodal distribution at Rice. I got it at the Yale School of Management. It's just kind of the way high-performing people are. Because failure hurts. You know, it's painful when things don't go our way. And so, in this case, many of us admit that if we do poorly, we'd rather not let anyone know. Now, the second question I asked you to, to answer was about competition. When I compete with someone that seems better than me, I sort of give up trying. Okay? And your pattern here, I will tell you, is unique. It is more unique to a service academy than it is to Yale or than it is to Rice. So you, most people strongly agreed or disagreed with that notion. How many of you have a background as a high school competitive athlete? There you go. So you see the effect that athletics can have on leadership and on, on people's willingness to try hard things. And you don't quit. I mean, it's a fundamental military value. We just don't quit. And so that's reflected here, although technically we also have a bimodal distribution here. Because look, that neutral point is down much lower than the somewhat agree and, and then agree. So again, a bimodal distribution, two, two groups of people, one of which may be a little, you know, being limiting themselves a little bit in terms of fear of failure. And then, look, the third one, I sometimes avoid difficult tasks because I'm afraid of making mistakes. Now, for somebody that wants to do great things, this is a tough one. This is a tough one because... If you try to do things that are challenging, if you go after the hard jobs, if you go after the tough missions, you know, it's not always going to go your way. And if you turn them down because you're afraid of making a mistake or you're afraid of failing, then you're going to plateau out at perhaps far too early. And once again, we see a bimodal distribution and really quite a few people. I mean, that's the people who somewhat agree or agree or strongly agree, you know, that's about... 200 people here. So all I want to do with this is, is sort of highlight your sensitivity to the fact that there is a thing called fear of failure, that it can kind of get under our skin, and that it impacts the way that you develop as an officer, and it will impact the way you make decisions about leading. And you have to understand this about yourself and about the people around you, because the higher you go as a leader, the more you're going to be asking people to do difficult things. And when you see the world through their eyes, what are those eyes revealing? They're probably not much different than you right here. You know, probably a third of them are really worried about letting you down. They are really worried about the impact it's going to have, not just on their career, but on them, you know, as a person on their own self-esteem and their own self-discipline self, uh, and self-respect. That's why all the service academies have strong programs in psychology, so that you can know yourself better, and by knowing yourself better, lead better. So let's talk a little bit now about what young leaders need to know about fear of failure and about guilt and about shame. See, I told you this is going to be kind of dark side, right, that we weren't just going to be talking about you know, the wonderful stuff. So first thing, fear of failure. You know, if, maybe if you were over in that, in that second distribution and you feel like you're a little more concerned about failure than you wanted to be, you know, where do you think that comes from? How do people get it? Is it genetic? Is it learned? Did you have some kind of really singular, horrific experience that, you know, forever influenced the way you think? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where researchers say that fear of failure comes from. It comes from your parents. It's principally learned. It distributes like a personality trait. But we get it from our parents. And you are fortunate enough 
to be in a generation that has highly involved parents. So sometimes their expectations and your unwillingness to let them down and your fear of letting them down turns into a consistent way of behaving. So it's not in your genes. That's not how you get it from your parents. But over time, watching their pride and sometimes their disappointment and your response to that, sometimes you just get a little too concerned with it and it sticks a little bit. And that's what fear of failure, that's where it comes from. In fact, when I say parents, I'm trying to be a little bit egalitarian. What the research actually says is it comes from your mom. Okay, it comes from the mother's side in terms of influence on young people. And that's not a Freudian thing. That just has to do with who does a lot of the early childhood development, who you learn a lot from. And when people ask me who I learned uh, more about, about leadership from than anybody else, and I've been around a lot of really great leaders in my life, I always say my mother. That's the first thing that comes out of my mouth. And unfortunately, she passed away on the 29th of December this year. But she and my father had a huge impact on me, as I know that your parents have had on you. This is just a little piece of dark side from that. And the good news is, because it's learned, that means you can change it. Okay, that means by checking yourself, by checking other people when you see them hesitate, that over time, through the right kind of coaching and development, like you get from your AOCs, you can get out from under that. But it's something you don't want to indulge. Because you know what? You're entering a business that does not operate well without some degree of risk. Okay, it does not operate well without some degree of risk. And so unless you're ready to step up and, and manage some of that and take some of that risk, it's gonna be a problem for you. So, if we're afraid of failure, it's, it, it tends to follow then that we're afraid of either feeling guilty or we're afraid of being ashamed. And as it turns out, guilt and shame are associated with leadership. Feelings of guilt or feelings of shame influence the way you lead. So what, is, what does the research say about that? Well, first of all, let's make clear about what's the difference between the two. So guilt, that's a gift that you give yourself. Only you can feel guilty. That's when your conscience or when your inner self is holding you accountable for something. And you feel bad because of something that you've done. Shame is something that other people give you. Other people have to shame you. And military, for better or for worse, is a high accountability culture. Philosophers might call it a shame culture. But it's one where we don't want to let the people down from the academy. We don't want to let people in our squadron down. And consequently, we can feel ashamed. And they can make us feel ashamed. So understand the difference between those two terms. Guilt is a gift you give yourself. Shame is something that other people give you. Now, in terms of leader performance... What do you think guilt does for that? Is it good or is it bad in terms of the research on how it makes leaders perform? So I'm not going to take a bunch of questions. We'll have Q&A at the end. But I'll just tell you, guilt is associated with slightly better leadership than not. And why is that? Well, when you look at the personality dimensions that are associated with guilt, we can see these by using a measure called the Big Five. Feelings of guilt or conscientiousness or personal accountability. That's what focuses us on our duty. That's what makes us get up in the middle of the night when we'd rather not to and go out and check what airmen are doing. That's what makes that, that feeling of accountability or of conscientiousness feeds into feelings of guilt and because we tend to be driven by that, it makes us slightly better leaders. So don't ever feel bad about kicking yourself a little and holding yourself accountable. That's just a natural part 
of being a conscientious leader. But shame, shame is different because it's inherently organizational. Now you've got an organization that's impacting your emotions through shame. And research shows that is not associated with better leadership. In fact, it's associated not only with, with less effective personal leadership on the part of individuals, but it's also destructive inside the organization. So your goal, the kind of an organization that you want to work in, is an organization where every member of that organization holds themselves accountable to a degree that's probably more than others in the organization hold them accountable. And that way, the leadership inside that organization benefits a little bit from that conscientiousness or guilt, but it doesn't have to bear those negative dark side consequences of shame. And that, folks, is how guilt and shame interact in a leader development environment and in the leadership environment that you all are going to be immersed in, most of you for at least another 10 years. Okay, guilt, not that bad, gift you give yourself. Shame, only other people can shame you. And when you find yourself doing it to somebody else, check yourself. It's probably not necessary. I'm looking out across an audience of some of the most conscientious young leaders in the world. See the world through their eyes. Okay. I always, when I'm talking to younger leaders, and you know at Rice, <clears throat> the institute that I founded two and a half years ago is called the Ann and John Doerr Institute for New Leaders. So it's all about teaching younger people how to lead. And there is a time value to leadership that will benefit you all for the rest of your lives. The fact that you are working on your own leader development right now with the help of the academy and its, and its staff and faculty has a time value that pays forward. Why is that? Because you're being developed on certain behavioral competencies and your identity's changing. And the longer that has to foment, the longer a time the things you learn begin to interact with one another. You know, one day here you learn something about decision making. Another day you learn about communicating. And for the rest of your time, those two competencies begin to interact. Over time, it pays dividends. It's bigger than the sum of its parts. But one thing that often holds people back or causes concern among young leaders is this notion of, well, am I really going to be able to lead? You know, I'm going to go out there, many of these you know, airmen and non-commissioned officers are going to have been in the Air Force or whatever military branch you're in, Army, for many years. They've been back and forth, you know, to combat. My son-in-law, um, and I'm staying with him now, he's, the, he's a major, he's uh, uh, 05 West Point graduate and chief of ops at 4th ID at Carson. He's getting ready to go to Afghanistan for his fourth combat tour. You know, and but when you're younger and you know you're going to go to a unit that has folks like that in it, you, you ask yourself, am, am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to pull, it, pull this off? Everybody keeps talking to me about how courageous I have to be. You know, is that going to be there when I need to do it? And I tell everybody this kind of the same thing. There are a lot of things that you can't control about being a, a young officer or, or a cadet. And all people are looking for from you when you get into those units is that you are high and competent on the things you can control. Stuff like how physically fit are you when you get to your first duty assignment? That's totally under your control. And when people see you show up and you're ready to go to work and you know the things that you're supposed to know, there's a halo effect and they assume you're a pretty competent person and they'll give you the benefit of the doubt and they'll help you. But if you're not good at the things that are under your control, well, then they begin to wonder, well, when things really get bad, can I, can I really trust this person? Don't worry about being able to lead when you graduate from the Air Force Academy. You will be more than ready to lead. 
Just make sure that you've done the things that you're in control of before you get there. Because people are going to be watching you like a hawk. And when they see that you've done the things that you could, they know that you as a leader will be there for them. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. You, your career will take off like a rocket. You will learn the things you need to learn. So just put this fear about being able to lead thing that almost every young person has when they're in this kind of environment and just put it away. You, you, will, you will be ready. Okay. Let's do more dark side work here. Name this leader behavior, and don't, don't shout it out, but just kind of put it in your head. When fear and excess self-interest override doing or saying what's right, good, and of help to others or oneself. What is that? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's something that, you know, I'm, I've been involved in leader development in industry for 15 years working for companies like GE, Goldman Sachs, Google. Nobody talks about this. It's one of the most important things for a leader to manage, and nobody wants to talk about this term. Whoops. And the term is cowardice. The term is cowardice. Everybody, listen, everybody at conferences wants to talk about courage. And they bring in courageous role models, heroic, inspirational people and stuff like that. Everybody wants to talk about courage. We see cowardly behavior every day. Every day. But nobody wants to talk about it. And, you know, I'm convinced that one of the reasons no one wants to talk about cowardice is that they immediately go to making it a dispositional quality of an individual. That person is a coward. When in fact, when you look at that definition, excess self-interest, I guarantee you everybody in this room is capable of cowardly behavior at some point in time. We're all self-interested. It's natural to be self-interested. But when you become overly self-interested, that's when we label it as cowardice. Only people are really unwilling to do that because again, you know, immediately someone's going to say, well, are you calling me a coward? I don't think there's a single coward in this room. But every one of you has to balance your own self-interest against the sacrifices and the duties that you're going to have to, be, have to do here. And, you know, it's even harder in the business environment where self-interest is one of the foundations of business. And that's one of the reasons why business ethics is kind of the holy grail I mean, think, if you would, about how many ethical lapses you've heard of, whether they were in high-profile businesses or somebody cheating on an exam or somebody doing some other kind of ethical transgression. Can't you really track it back to excess self-interest? You know, some unwillingness to raise your hand and take a hit, some unwillingness to, you know, not take advantage when you had the opportunity to cheat or you had the opportunity to do something that advantaged you and maybe it looked other people, made other people look bad. We see cowardly behavior almost every day. And that doesn't mean that we're living and working with cowards. It means that one of the fundamentals of understanding how ethical mistakes are made is to understand that excessive self-interest is at the root of cowardly behavior. I, I, I've got a great story for you about why why people who behave in cowardly ways aren't necessarily cowards. I was given a talk in uh, Manukau, New Zealand, uh, a couple of years ago. And it was, it was a great deal. I gave a talk to a bunch of businessmen in a room like this, and then they paid for me to give it again, but to all the firefighters and first responders, police officers, and so forth in that part of New Zealand. And we talked about this stuff called in extremist leadership, which I... I wrote a book about in 2007, and, and uh, some of you may even study it here from time to time. And after I gave the, the talk, I was a, there was a reception, you know, so I'm standing there drinking a glass of, you know, cheap wine out of a plastic cup, and here, here comes this firefighter, and he is like the poster 
of a firefighter. He was about six foot four, big white handlebar mustache. He had medals. I mean, if he was in the, in the military, this would have been a two or three star general. And he comes up to me and he was obviously a little, you know, concerned. And he said, you know, I'd really like to talk to you <clears throat> about what you said up there because something's been bothering me for the past few months. And I said, sure, chief, you know, what is it? And he said, well, he said, I was, about three months ago, I was off duty. And it was a Saturday morning, and I went into a, uh, a bodega because I wanted to get a cup of coffee. So I poured my cup of coffee, and I got in line. And all of a sudden, somebody runs into that bodega with a handgun to rob the place. Obviously an unexpected turn of events. And I said, really? I said, that doesn't happen very often. He goes, I know. I said, well, what'd you do? He said, there was a 72-year-old woman in line ahead of me. And I grabbed her, and I pushed her into the gunman, and I ran out the door. And I was like, I was floored, you know? And there were tears in his eyes. And he said to me, he said, am I a coward? And that obviously wasn't true. And so my first response to him was, well, welcome to the human race. Did anybody get hurt? And he said, no, nobody got hurt. He said, but I haven't been able to sleep very well. That's guilt, right? No shame. Nobody, nobody knew he did that. Except probably that lady. She was probably not happy with him. Um, but, you know, I said, listen, let me tell you something about where what we call courage comes from. You know, you get an alarm in the firehouse, you have a huge ritual embedded in a culture of like-minded people. You all go, you get your, there's, there's a bell ringing, you all go and you get your equipment, you put on the same clothes, you've done it a thousand times, you know what the expectations are, you go into a building, and you do things that are 10 times as dangerous as that person walking into that bodega. But then you take that off. You strip away all that training, all that familiarity with the situation, and you are surprised by this kind of threat, and you respond like most humans respond. In this case, with excessive self fear and excessive self-interest overriding doing or saying what was right or good. Was it a cow was it cowardly behavior? Absolutely. Is he a coward? Absolutely not. Are all of you capable of that level of egregious cowardly behavior? I would argue, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because this is human nature. What you're here at the academy to learn is that culture, is that set of expectations, is that training, is that familiarity with the uniform and the tools of the trade that are going to keep you going and allow you to do behaviors that we will look at and we will say, that's courageous. And when somebody pins a medal on your chest for it, you're going to turn to them and you're going to say, I don't really think I'm a courageous person. You know, I don't really think I'm a hero. And the truth of the matter is, it's really not about courage or cowardice that much. It's about what you learn, how you discipline yourself to lead. But I would argue that understanding cowardice among your people, and I'm not talking about like flat out panic where people are fleeing their duty stations. I'm just saying when you learn to spot somebody who's in a unit, who's really out for themselves, who's excessively self-interested, who's always spotlighting for the leadership, but they're really not there for their peers, you need to pay attention to that. You need to pay attention to that. Because when that kind of behavior becomes consistent, it erodes your units. So I guess the lesson here, and something that you all may want to talk about with yourselves, is you know, what really is courage and what really is cowardice? And is it really about being a courageous person or a coward cowardly person? Or is it more about how we discipline our thinking, how we train our people? and especially about the relationship of ourselves to our duty and our unit. Because if you are unwilling to subordinate your self-interest 
to the units that you're about to go serve in, you, you made a bad choice. You were in the wrong profession because you'll only be rewarded long term when you're willing to, to give up some of that self-interest. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about some of these cases of failure, some of which were pretty significant. Are you ready to do that? You want to look at some of these case studies? I will tell you, these are definitely real. So here was the first question you got of the first case study. It says question four because it was after those fear of failure things. But it's a situation where you had a gun line where there's some propellant storage going on and a service member came back from a smoke break and still had a cigarette in their hand. And this is the kind of thing that as a lieutenant, you'll be faced with the enforcement of standards at airfields and in other, you know, in hospital settings. I mean, you name it, enforcement of standards is going to be what you're responsible for. And so in this case, the service member came back, had this lit cigarette, and when he was confronted about it, he tossed it. Only instead of that cigarette going where it would have been safe, it got into the propellant. And there was a big fire. And people got hurt. Seven people got dusted off that firing point in helicopters. One was really bad. So there was an investigation. There was an investigation. And, and people, of course, were focused on that leader and looked at him. And then they decided... They were going to have to decide, you know, how do you hold people accountable? You know, I mean, these individuals, uh, and I'm fairly familiar with this, you know, they were running off the back of a burning truck in the middle of the night with their hair burned off and flash blinded. So we're talking about seven people running across this firing point blind. Okay, and pandemonium breaks out. So as a lead, you know, how do you hold that leader accountable that let that happen? And so we asked you all that. Now, we've got some folks here who, uh, who helped us, uh, are going to help us, and that they're going to tell us why they retained or relieved this leader uh, for cause. And so, do we have someone here who's, who uh, was prepared to talk about why they would retain a leader who had that happen? Do we have those folks here? Here we go, yeah. Go, go ahead and go to the mic and, and tell your classmates what you thought. Good evening, sir. Uh, C4C Vincent Lombardi, CS38. Uh, I recommended this situation uh, to retain the leader because at a certain point, it becomes how the service member was brought up or how they were trained. And if they won't listen to the rules or follow them, there's only so much a leader can do. Okay. Yeah, everything's not under a leader's control, for sure. Okay, how about somebody who said, fire this leader? Who's, when, when you said to relieve this leader, why would you say to relieve that leader? Uh, hello, Sarah. I cut fourth class, Megan Rab from CSO8. Uh, I chose to relieve this leader because the investigation revealed that there were general safety practices in line, but that is your person, and eight people were seriously injured. And if you can't... Um, have that kind of influence over your person to make sure that they wouldn't like negligently just throw that cigarette where there was propellant. I don't know how you can be upholding safety standards. Yeah, there's got to be accountability, right? You can't tolerate a lack, a blatant lack of standards, particularly when there's an injury. So, fair enough. I mean, I can see, I can see where both of you are coming from. What your class said was this right here. So, retain the leader was only 23% and either relieve the leader or retain the leader but not in a leadership position or something other bad, you know, was about 75%. So most of you agreed that in this case, accountability meant that somebody got fired. Fair enough. Let's go to another one. This was question five. And this is something that has to be near and dear to the hearts of people in the Air Force because you all are a nuclear force, right? And so here is a, a situation where you've got a nuke weapons assembly team. You know, most, most nuke weapons don't come in a box like you got them at Costco. You got to, you know, you got to put them together and there are rules about assembly teams and they're really, really strict rules. You know, you have to have sandbags around the nuclear weapons as they're being worked on. And there is a standard 
for how big a grain of sand can be in those sandbags. And in a nuke weapon technical inspection, it's not that unusual for an inspector to cut open a sandbag and sift them to see if they find any rocks. That's detail. That is detail. And in this case, two members of the assembly team just a couple weeks out from a nuke weapons technical inspection, they discover, oops, we just didn't kind of get around to getting their security clearances. And you can, you can get away in that maybe in the White House right now or something, but you, you cannot get away with that in a nuclear weapons environment, right? So how, what do you think? Somebody here, somebody who said this person should be relieved, can you tell us what your rationale was for relieving that person? I think somebody's ready to go to a mic right here. Sir, I'm C4C Allred from Squadron 38, and my recommendation in this situation was to fire the leader. Um, not having security clearance when dealing with nuclear weapons is not a small deal. It could turn into a life or death situation. We're potentially talking about World War III. Um, without background checks, we don't really know who these people are. They could be great people, or they could be spies from other countries with bad intentions. Um, Failing to do a background check is a huge national security risk and is unforgivable in this situation. Okay, fair enough. And how about, the, how about a counter view? Somebody maybe decided there could be reasons why you might want to retain this person. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Cadet Fourth Class Remington Vale, and um, I'm in Squadron 5. My position regarding this nuclear leader would be to retain him. Um, the fact that the mistake was caught two weeks ahead of time before the nuclear uh, weapons technical inspection prove this leader was doing the right thing and checking to make sure all regulatory and legal requirements were met if this mistake had been caught during the actual inspection we'd have no choice but to fire them and get rid of um, those people that didn't have their security clearances thanks to this leader's proactiveness and attention to detail we found the major issue ahead of time and corrected it and um, if they did have to report this to the Pentagon I feel like that would be the right thing to say um, I would also have the leader ahead of time um, report back to me on why these two members happened to slip through so that didn't happen again in the future. Thank fair, you. fair enough. Kind of seeing the world through the eyes of that particular person uh, and looking at the time sequencing. All right? And then what you all said, boom, he's gone or she's gone. Okay? Mostly 63% said relieve the leader. Another 17% said yeah, but. So... That person did not survive this particular um, incident in their career. All right, <clears throat> here's the next question. Challenging major project. You're in a staff role now. This, this leader's in a staff role. Challenging project, and the bottom line is they just didn't get it done. They just failed. It was an important thing. It could have really benefited the unit, and they just didn't get it done. So what do you think about accountability here? Who, who, the two people who said retain or relieve, why don't you go up together so it'll go quicker and tell us why, uh, why you argued what you argued. Hey, good afternoon, sir. My name is C4C Mortensen from Squadron 38. And I chose to relieve this leader because he is a high-ranking officer as a major. He's had enough experience in the service to know what is it expected of him and how to carry out certain responsibilities. Fair enough. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Cora Gornall from CS18. So my recommendation in this situation was to retain the leader but limit their future pr promotion potential. No immediate danger or threat to life was caused by this incompletion. But it didn't, so it didn't ju justify instant relieval. However, the failure to complete the assigned task deprived the Air Force of a game-changing training opportunity. The Air Force needs motivated members that will advance its mission. So by limiting the future promotions of incompetent members, they ensure future success. OK, fair enough. All right, and what did the class say? They said mostly retain. Still, you know, about 50% said retain but hurt their career in some way and, and some said to relieve. So a little bit more balanced here. You know, a little bit more discussion about whether just failing at a task 
is worth doing somebody in. Okay, last one, big one here. Combat vehicles, darkness, people driving, and a driver makes a mistake. Drives through a bridge abutment. 35 ton vehicle goes end over end, 60 feet into 20 feet of water. Five soldiers dead at the scene. Two ejected and survived. And then it's discovered that that person who was driving, being supervised by a, a lieutenant, didn't have a completed driver's license training. He was a driver, he was learning, but he didn't have his certificate yet. And that was not known to the unit. So they fire the operations officer, they fire the person who is supposed to be checking those, those uh, licensing forms. Because we got dead people here. I mean, this is a big deal. This is CNN, you know. This is five families. Okay, so the question is, do you fire the unit's commander? Do you de basically decapitate the leadership of the unit? Or do you fire that person whose responsibility was to check? So, folks, we had somebody say retain, somebody say uh, relieve. Both of you go up together, so it'll go a little bit quicker. Hi, uh, Cadet 4th Class, Maria Gaspar Bitch from Cadet Squadron 8. Uh, we, I decided that we should be able to retain this officer, but it might hurt his potential and future advancement in his career. This is a very big issue. Uh, obviously, there's five families who are not going to be able to see their family members after this. But at the same point, there's some responsibility at the lower, lower levels as well. Okay. And then from the other perspective. Good afternoon, sir. Cadet 4th Class Mark Shell, Cadet Squadron 12. I chose to fire this officer because this wasn't just a failure, this was a catastrophe. There were five service members killed, and as you said, those are men with family, men and women with family. So this needs to be dealt with at a high level because this was a huge failure. So that was my take on it. Okay, terrific. Terrific analysis by the class. Terrific analysis by all of you. Definitely a uh, tendency to relieve this uh, particular commander to go ahead and decapitate that unit. So right now, uh, I do have a film that applies, a little film clip, that explains some more about this last case. If we could please uh, roll that clip, that'll help us out here. Certainly, as a person who's been uh, out there serving in dangerous contexts, but also helping people become leaders. You've been in places where you've you know, swung for the fences and, and missed. Uh, could you share a, a time or a, a place when that happened to you? Seven of my soldiers were involved in a training accident in which five of them were killed. And it was at two o'clock in the morning. They drove a, an armored vehicle off a bridge uh, into deep water just south of the demilitarized zone in the Republic of Korea. And as I, as I face that uh, crisis, that challenge, as a leader, I assume responsibility for their training, for their lives, uh, and at some level, I believe I failed them. I believe that if uh, I had operated more acutely in terms of driver's training and in terms of the complex operation that I had ongoing, uh, that perhaps they would have been better trained and they wouldn't have fallen victim to that accident. It caused me to realize, too, because of the way I was treated by my leaders, how a leader needs to be treated in a crisis. It, uh, it taught me humility. It taught me that it's important to coach people through that. And I was coached by a, a wonderful uh, two-star general named Bob Dees who met me on that bridge uh, as they were still recovering bodies. The first thing he said to me was, you know, Tom, it's not what happens to an organization that determines its success or failure. It's how the leader responds to that that really matters. And I'll never forget that. And it, it's made me very resilient in other crises. And I hope it's made me a better leader to other people who were in crises who needed support from the top. Okay. So for any of you who are a little slow on the uptake, you know, 
that, lead, that leader failure, that last uh, crisis was, was me. In fact, all four of those were failures I had as a leader in the conduct of my career as a lieutenant, a captain, a major, and a lieutenant colonel. And obviously, I didn't get fired. So what we're going to do is we're going to take you into a different level of understanding about what the thought process is when bad things happen, okay? And I'm going to talk to you about why these failures, why I wasn't fired, because you know what? I asked every one of my bosses why they didn't fire me, because much like the folks who came up here and said relieve, it seemed to me pretty re reasonable that I'd get fired in every one of those circumstances. So with the propellant thing, the air was found to be common in multiple organizations that were just like mine. It was a propellant storage issue, and it could have happened to anybody. And what the leader told me was, you can never afford to fire a high-performing officer who was unlucky. This could have happened to any other unit there. And so from his perspective, um, it just wasn't the right time. They were pleased because I got these guys dusted off and taken care of and I took care of the rest of the unit. And I'd only been in the organization three months. I'd been a lieutenant three months when this happened. Okay. So don't think that just because something goes bad on your watch that you're going to be sacrificed to some kind of karmic god of justice. People think what's going to make the unit better. That's what these folks think about. And this person's name was Philip Rhinus. He retired as a colonel. He's in San Antonio, Texas. He has no idea I'm talking about him. He has no idea what happened in my career. But he was the investigating officer. Okay. Okay, the second one. Nuke surety. So when you're commanding a nuclear-capable artillery battery in the Federal Republic of Germany, and when your lieutenant says, oh, by the way, sir, we just found out that two of our assemblers doesn't have clearances, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I mean, it would be, it was unimaginable. And so I called my boss, and I said, I have very bad news, you know, and I don't know how to tell you this, and it's all my fault, but we have two assemblers that don't have clearances. Now, from my perspective, it was unforgivable, and I think maybe even the young uh, lady who, who spoke about that said it was unforgivable. I agree. I agree. But what he said, the first words out of his mouth was, Captain Kolditz, when did you find out about this? And I said, about three minutes ago. And he said, that's the right answer. You know, never forget that bad news is not like bourbon. It does not get better with age. And when you hold back, you are, you are burning your own daylight. Because one of the things I didn't understand about this, and it's something that someone else said, was that he, could have, he fixed it. In two weeks, those guys were standing that inspection with full secret security clearances. It was something that at my level, I had no clue that that could be done. I thought we were doomed. But I didn't sit on it. And the second thing I did was I told him it was all my fault. Now, if you all ever take a class on social psychology, and I'm a social psychologist, you're going to learn about the generation of counterarguments in attitude change. So when I tell him, when I tell my boss, I accept full responsibility, this is all my fault, what kind of counterargument does he generate? It's not all your fault. You've got a lieutenant, you've got NCOs at the wing level or the brigade level, we've got inspectors. You're just one person. It's not just all your fault. But if I'd have said, I've got this incompetent lieutenant down there, sir, it's all his fault, then what goes into his head? Well, Captain, what the hell am I paying you for? Always accept responsibility for stuff that goes wrong in your area. Don't try to pin it on somebody else. It's not going to help you. And it could help you a lot to admit it. At the end of the day, it would have been embarrassing to have to file a, a report on a, on a blown NWTI, but we didn't fail it. That leader is a guy named Keith Dayton. He retired as a three-star general, and until very recently, he was the principal running 
the Marshall Center in Garmisch Partenkirch in Germany. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Pretty good judgment. Okay, so here it is, a major project. I'm a staff officer. I'm at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and they want this big training simulation done with live artillery, live uh, jet aircraft, infantrymen, machine guns, mortars, all of it synchronized like the Boston Silk Philharmonic. And in the time that I had to do it, which was substantial, it was like six months, I just couldn't do it. I just could not get everybody lined up. I couldn't figure out how to do it safely. And, and you know, time ran out and I just didn't get it done. And so I asked the guy why he didn't fire me and he said, well, he said, yeah, you didn't get it done, but I'm not sure anybody else could have either. You know, you've got a good reputation. And having money in the bank, the longer you serve in the military, the more people know what your level of competence is. They begin to get confident that they don't have a, situ a problem with that individual. There's something circumstantial. I was being pulled different ways by different senior leaders, including the division commander, the division artillery commander. And this was an opportunity cost. Yes, it was a failure, but it was failure to capitalize on an opportunity. Okay, it didn't collapse an operation or, or get people hurt. And, um, you know, so I just got away with not getting the job done. And I, had, and I told him I had no excuse other than, I mean, I, I had worked in that unit. We were working so hard that I didn't have a day off from the 5th of July until two days before Thanksgiving. Not a Sunday, not a holiday. And this is peacetime in the 101st Airborne Division. So I think that person understood he was pushing us. You know, he was pushing us as hard as he could. He was a hard-charging lieutenant colonel named David Petraeus. And then the last one, the big one, where soldier, soldiers get killed. Um, you know, when I met... General Dees, my division commander, on the bridge where this incident occurred, and it was just south of the DMZ in the Republic of Korea. I, I, I went up to him, and I, I knew him quite well. He, I, he had worked with me as a, when he was a colonel in the 101st. And I just kind of threw up my arms, and I said, sir, I, I just don't even know where to start. And the first thing he said to me was, look, you know, this is about taking care of the soldiers that you have, those 800 soldiers that are back there. You're gonna wake them up tomorrow morning and you're gonna tell them that five of their buddies are dead. Okay. And you're gonna to have to plan this and you're gonna to have to manage that unit. But things happen based on how people respond to the challenges they're given, not that these things happen. And he could tell that I knew that and that it wasn't that much you know, that it wasn't that much um, comfort to me. You know, this was basically the more, in Korea time, it was the morning of Halloween in the U.S. And the doorbell was going to ring, and these families were going to go, you know, to give candy to kids, and there was going to be a chaplain and an officer waiting there for him. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I respect what you're doing, but you need to get over yourself. Do you think you're going to command a unit spread over 30 miles with combat vehicles running everywhere, with weapons on them, with huge stockpiles of ammunition, and you're going to operate in this environment and do this job and nobody's ever going to get killed? Get over yourself. This happens in our work. This happens in our, in our chosen profession. And it happens in yours as well. And so one of the things I took from that, and I've told people all over the country about this, in at Google and everywhere else, if you think you're going to get through some sort of competitive environment without some really significantly bad things happening, you know, go work retail somewhere. <laughs> you know, just go do something else. Because in your careers, you're going to have things like this happen. You're not going to be artillery officers, so they're not going to be exactly like this. But you're going to have to deal with, the, with people's deaths. You're going to have to deal with, 
you know, big problems in units that get reported all over the world. That's what you're getting paid for. That's not something you're trying to avoid forever because you won't. You will not avoid it. That's what you're getting paid for. That's why personal integrity is important so that stuff doesn't get swept under a rug. That's why when you walk across the cadet area, you see your honor code put up across the, across the, uh, the wall there because you don't tolerate people that sweep things under the rug, people that dump on their peers, people who act with excessive self-interest. And if you play back what happened to me in all of those ridiculous airs, you know, stuff, stuff that I wish never would have happened. And listen, trust me, I've got 10 others that I could give you. But when you go back and you look across that, the one thing that I didn't do was focus on myself. And I think really in the profession of arms, in your chosen profession, that's really all you're going to have to do. Because you've got the brains, for sure. Everybody in here is smart enough to be a fabulous officer in the Air Force. You know, everybody in here has the constitution. Remember, it's not about being a coward or being a hero. It's about your behavior. It's about things you can shape and develop. And what I would tell you, if we were going to break from here and then never talk about this again, um, and, and these were just the, the, re, the rationales why I didn't get fired, accountability fixed at multiple levels. The guy who was really in charge of that driver got hurt, physically and mentally. He lived, but he was not a happy, happy man after that. Um, but what I would tell you is, you need to reflect on your failures. Don't, don't sweep them under your own carpet and never learn from them. So I know you're going to talk about this later tonight, but you know, the next time you have a quiet time with a peer, you know, you're on a bus going somewhere, or you're waiting at the Colorado Springs airport to go to some athletic event or whatever, you know, talk about the last time something went really badly for you, whether it was in high school or whether it was at the academy. You know, and if it cost you, talk about that. And if it didn't, you know, talk about what you learned from it. And then listen to the other persons. Because one of the big lies, you know, one of the things that drives this fear of failure is you look to your right and your left and you think, nobody ever, no, nobody is going to make mistakes like I'm going to make. Well, look, there's somebody standing up in front of you right now that wound up getting a star, and I made lots of mistakes. I made lots of mistakes. And I would like to believe that those officers, Dayton, Petraeus, Bob Dees, all of them multi-star generals, that they had the unit's best interest in mind when they decided what to do with me. Never about me. It's about what decision is going to make the unit better. Bob Dees in the Republic of Korea is deciding whether he wants to completely decapitate the leadership of one of only nine artillery battalions on the Korean Peninsula, U.S. artillery battalions. You know? And he, I think in the end he thought, you know what, it's not worth taking this colonel out because I need him to be working tomorrow morning at 0600 when 800 soldiers line up. You know, he needs to fix that and they need to be ready to fight that evening. The mission didn't go away. So with that, I'm just gonna tell you, it's been a terrific honor to be here in front of you. Don't ever be afraid of your failures. Don't ever be afraid to admit to it because for every failure that you all have in your Air Force careers, I guarantee you, you're going to do 20 things right or 50 things right. And for that, as a citizen of the U.S. and somebody that's pretty optimistic about where our country's headed, thank you very much. Brigadier General Kolditz, thank you for your message and for sharing your thoughts on how we can be more competent leaders. At this time, I would like to open the floor for questions. I will announce the last question as we approach two minutes remaining in the session. Anybody with a question? If you do, just go to one of those mics, because like I told you, I'm an artilleryman. We can't hear that well. Sure. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Cadet Huffman. I go to Boston University. 
Uh, you talked about the difference between guilt and shame. You talked about how shame is more of an organizational thing. Well, what happens if you come upon people in an organization that don't really have that conscience, that don't really have guilt when they mess up? How, can you instill conscience into people with your organization? Or is it something that people are just born with and you have to get rid of them if they're not feeling that way? Yeah, both, okay? So it's a personality trait. It, it tends to be enduring. Conscientiousness, as it's measured on the Big Five, you tend to measure the same way over the course of your lifetime. But you know what? We also learn it from the people around us. And that's one of the reasons why it's really worthwhile to surround yourself with the kind of people that you want to be. You know, and do your best to choose organizations on that basis. So when you're going up for your next job, you know, when you go on your next interview, don't just look at how much they're going to pay you or whether the job is in Hawaii versus Flint, Michigan or, or wherever. You need to look at the people who are going to be around you. And you need to decide not only, you know, can you work with them, but are they the kind of people that you want to have influence you in, in your life? And if you do that, you're going to wind up in organizations and you're going to wind up helping to build organizations where conscientiousness is valued, you know, and it's driving a sense of duty and a sense of, of obligation. And when you're in a position to make choices on who gets promoted, you know, don't, don't just think in terms of the person who sells the most or the highest performer. You know, think in terms of the person who's influencing that organization in a constructive way and making it better. You know, when, if you ever go to business school, you will study organizations like Enron, Arthur Anderson, huge organizations that were took down by people who were not conscientious. And so, you know, don't ever let that go. Just don't walk by that and live your life that way. And then if enough people do that, we'll all be in good shape. Another one here. Good afternoon, sir. Cadet Amore. My question is, from your time at West Point and your short time here at the Air Force Academy, what is something that our academy can do to better encourage the fear of failure and better propel our future lieutenants in the Air Force? Yeah, so I think we're doing it. You know, I mean, I think this conference is a great, a, 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 a great process of reflection. And you know, tonight after dinner, you all are gonna kinda of have breakouts and you're gonna, you're gonna be in facilitated reflective discussions about this. But you know, that needs to go on for the rest of your professional career. You know, because you're gonna spend time at airfields waiting and you're gonna spend time, you know, in other per places where you're with other people. And you can talk about football if you want or you can talk about, you know, whatever. But, you, you know, have some conversations about what it means to be in the profession of arms and, and have some conversations about what it means to put yourself last when it comes to your unit and your, your soldiers or your airmen. Um, you know, that gets noticed. And I've had people, for, really for my whole career as a senior officer, ask me, you know, you, you're, you're commanding this unit, you've got... You've got five subordinate commanders, they're all excellent, but you know you can only get one of them to the next grade. You know, how do you, how do you find that person? How do, you, how do you know what that is? And I always pick somebody who is not afraid to ad admit their own failings, and especially who makes all boats rise. They make their peers better. And the people who heroically spotlight and always wanted to show me how they were wonderful and never shared their good ideas with the people on their right and their left, they're not in the army anymore. And it was a surprise to them because they thought they were heroes. They thought they were really great, but they were loners. And you can't tolerate that in our profession. You know? And I, I think you know, these kinds of constructive discussions about failure and about cowardice and about courage, it builds into a culture and let's face it, you know, your culture from the Air Force Academy will follow you the rest of your life. That's by design. You know, that's by design. That honor code is not for something just at the Academy. That's for the rest of your life. And so, 
I think you're doing everything you can. Just keep it up. You know, just keep it up. I mean, I didn't go to Service Academy, I have to tell you. I'm incredibly impressed with them as leader development laboratories. The only thing I think that we do maybe a little bit better at Rice, and right now my institute works with a third of the Rice student body, we give professional leadership coaches from the business community to every student in the school who wants one for a whole semester. It's like a $7,000 benefit. But the only thing that they do as well or better in leadership is that we work on flat, non-hierarchical teams. And companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon have a lot of that. And here, the hierarchy is better established, and so you always know who's in charge. When you get out into the other parts of the world, a lot of times there's nobody in charge. And so you just have to learn how to lead in a flat, non-hierarchical organization, and we work hard on that. But I, I, my hat's off to you. I think service academies are the best places to, to learn leadership, and I think your academy does a particularly good job at it. Due to time, this will be our last question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, sir? Oh, okay. uh, Cadet Fourth Class, uh, Chandler Cunningham, Squadron 38. So you mentioned this and you touched upon it answering the last question, um, but being in the position you are today uh, and discussing the, the examples of leadership that you had, especially after situations that you found yourself in, um, did you ever find yourself giving that second chance or giving that chance to another person that you were in charge of? And how did your prior experience being in that position affect the decisions you decided to make? It had a huge effect on me and I was fiercely protective of my officers who had bad things happen when they were forthright, when they were honest, when they accepted responsibility, and when they weren't really, really drunk. <laughs> and when, when people made mistakes involving substance abuse, or when people made mistakes that they tried to cover up, or if, heaven forbid, they lied to me, that was the end. Character is so much more important than competence and outcomes. It is so much more important that, that I was fiercely protective of that in my organizations, and I did, I did what I could. And that doesn't mean I recommended everybody for below the zone promotion. You know, I had to make some tough calls. But one of the things I liked the best about being an Army officer was being fiercely protective of my people, you know. I mean, they were working for me. They were sacrificing a lot for me. Their families were sacrificing a lot. And I, I felt like I did everything I could for every one of them while I was in my command positions. Hey, y'all. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll be here till tomorrow. Appreciate it.